video, we'll be discussing the end of World War I and the preparations for peace that were designed to avoid another world war. As the nation, or as the, con sorry, as the world headed into early 1918, it was becoming increasingly clear that Germany was losing. And so the world began preparing for peace at this point. In January of 1918, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson uh, made public um, a document or a theory, foreign relations policy, that would become known as the 14 Points. It outlined Wilson's international view, his belief in a stable world order based on American principles that would avoid war in the future. There are a few key elements of the, this 14 points speech and of Wilsonian, uh, the Wilsonian approach to foreign policy. The first was a concept called national self-determination. This called for an end to empire and the beginning of the ability of nation states to govern themselves. A second characteristic was open diplomacy an end to these secret alliances that characterized Europe prior to World War I. Wilson called for arms reduction. No more of these naval arms races that had existed between Germany and Britain prior to World War I. And he called for collective security through diplomacy as overseen by a peacekeeping body known as the League of Nations. So this Wilsonian idealism was one of the guiding principles that characterized the Peace of Paris, which would end World War I. Another guiding principle was just the dealing with the consequences of World War I. The Great War, as it was called, was a devastating war. There were 38 million casualties of the First World War. Now casualties are death, injury, and permanent disability. But again, that was 38 million ca casualties out of 65 million people mobilized. That's 25,000 uh, casualties or 6,000 deaths per day for the 1,500 de days of World War I. The Allied powers had a little over 22 million casualties. The Central powers, about 15 million casualties. Nine million people were left dead. 22 million wounded, and 7 million permanently disabled by the experience of the war. Three empires had been destroyed by the war. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the German Empire. And the Russian Empire had um, collapsed as a result of the Russian Revolution. So World War I was an incredibly destructive war both in loss of life, in loss of political power, and in terms of economic costs. So after the weapons were laid down on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, there was a lot of recovery to accomplish. And at the Peace of Paris, which ended World War I, 27 different nations, all with competing and conflicting aims, participated. They were dominated by the Big Four, France, Britain, the United States, and Italy. So they were dominated by the victors. The leaders of the Central Powers, Germany and Austria-Hungary, um, and the Soviet Union were not included. The Peace of Paris included five separate treaties that dismantled three empires, the German, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman empires, and created a variety of newly independent states in Eastern Europe. And American President Woodrow Wilson came to the negotiating table with a great deal of idealism. He wanted to establish a peace based on his 14 points. But some of the European leaders were less than enamored with Wilsonian idealism. After all, the war had been fought on their territory. The economic and territorial damage was primarily in Europe. It was their citizenry who had survived the war. And the Europeans wanted revenge. They wanted reparations. 
many of their citizens were demanding a harsh peace. So much so that the French premier, or prime minister, Georges Clemenceau, is quoted as having said, Wilson bores me with his 14 points, why the good Lord himself has only 10. France and Clemenceau wanted retribution. But Wilson's 14 points appealed to moderates, convinced Germany that the peace would not be vindictive, and set the stage for hopes that would not be realized. Because Wilson met with limited success in his attempt to put his 14 points into, uh, into action. Some of his ideals weren't implemented at all, and others were implemented only partially or in a fundamentally flawed manner. We want to talk about the League of Nations, which was one of the 14 points that was put into motion after World War I. It was created after World War I, but in a fundamentally flawed way. This international peacekeeping force, the League of Nations, was organized to discuss um, issues of international concern in an effort to avoid war. It had been the brainchild of American President Woodrow Wilson, but the U.S. Congress failed to ratify it, so the U.S. never joined the League of Nations. Germany and Russia weren't invited to join, at least at first. Germany would not join until 1926, and the Soviet Union wouldn't join until 1935. So some power players in the globe, on the global scene weren't involved in the League of Nations, which was one of its weaknesses. Another weakness was the fact that it had no armed military to enforce its demands or its decisions. All they could really do was uh, shake their finger at recalcitrant nations and tell them not to do that again. So the League of Nations was, in many ways, doomed to fail, just because of these inherent weaknesses. They first met in November of 1920 and operated through three distinct agencies, the Assembly, the Council, and the Secretariat. They met annually to um, oversee their basic responsibilities, their international responsibilities, which included prevention of war through disarmament, resolving disputes between nations, and supervising the mandates of the League. Mandates were the formal central power colonies that were understood to be, quote, unready for independence. And they had some success in preventing war in Turkey or Upper Silesia, but the League of Nations is more associated with its failures. Like when they failed to create a, uh, an organized structure for mediating disputes. The first attempt to really streamline uh, the mediation of disputes happened in 1923 with the Treaty of Mutual Assistance. The, council, the, the Treaty of Mutual Assistance said that the Council should declare which side of a conflict was the aggressor within four days of the outbreak of the conflict, and then the League's member nations would support the victim. This treaty failed because many believed that four days wasn't enough time, and they resented the idea of mandatory military participation. The Geneva Protocol in 1925 mandated compulsory arbitration of international disputes and said that any nation unwilling to submit to the League's arbitration would be declared the aggressor. This was vetoed by the British delegation who feared that their overseas colonies would be uh, dragged into European affairs by the Geneva Protocol. So they really never set up an effective way of mediating disputes. Which led to failure number two, the fact that they, in many cases, didn't effectively mediate disputes, as happened um, in Teschen, which was a territory located between Poland and Czechoslovakia and contained valuable coal mines. Both Poland and Czechoslovakia wanted control of these natural resources, um, and so they turned to the League of Nations to mediate this dispute. The League of Nations gave most of the territory to Poland, with the exception of one of Teschen's suburbs. But it just so happened that that suburb 
contained the largest number of coal mines. And so Poland resented the fact that the League of Nations gave that over to Czechoslovakia. No actual conflict resulted, but Poland disagreed with the League's decisions and just refused to accept it. In 1920, Poland invaded Russia. The Russians were forced to sign the Treaty of Riga, which gave Poland nearly 80,000 square kilometers of uh, Russian territory. The League of Nations didn't try to prevent this action because Russia wasn't part of the League of Nations at this point. This led Russia, later the Soviet Union, to believe that the League of Nations was inherently biased. But perhaps no set of events demonstrated the weakness of the League of Nations as clearly as the actions of Nazi Germany in the early 1930s. In 1933, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. He withdrew Germany from the League of Nations. In 1935, he remilitarized Germany. So Germany had been stripped of its military by the Treaty of Versailles that was part of the Peace of Paris. And he, in 1935, Hitler um, rearmed Germany. The League of Nations did nothing. In 1936, Hitler sent German troops into the Rhineland, um, which was a territory that had been demilitarized by the Treaty of Versailles. France appealed to the League of Nations, and the League did nothing. In 1938, Germany allied with Austria in the Anschluss to expand German power into other parts of Central Europe. The League did nothing. And then in 1938, Germany, Hitler's Germany, Nazi Germany, invaded Czechoslovakia, specifically the German-speaking territory of the Sudetenland, gambling that the Western powers and the League of Nations would do nothing which they didn't, pursuing instead what was known as the policy of appeasement. The policy of appeasement was a belief that Germany had some legitimate grievances and that they could be appeased by giving them this ethnic German territory in Czechoslovakia. Obviously then, the biggest failure of the League of Nations was its inability to avoid World War II, because by 1939, Nazi Germany had been emboldened enough to invade Poland, the policy of appeasement had failed, and the world headed once again to war. Thank you.